This episode is brought to you by IT Pro TV, binge worthy learning for IT teams. Why is it binge worthy? It's learning presented in an engaging and entertaining talk show format that beats voiceover PowerPoint snooze fests. IT Pro TV offers an on demand course library with more than 3,300 hours of content. Watch on your desktop, on the go, or in the comfort of your own living room. IT Pro TV is IT training you and your team actually want to watch which means a better return on your learning investment. Get started with IT Pro TV for Teams with a special offer for Security Weekly listeners. Visit itpro.tv forward slash Security Weekly to start a seven day free trial and get 30% off a standard or premium IT Pro TV membership using the code SW30. Pony Express, check out their line of penetration testing devices, including the Pone Pad, Pone Phone, and Pone Pro. For enterprises, there's Pone Pulse, providing continuous visibility into wired, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth spectrums across all physical locations, including remote sites and branch offices. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. Stop attackers from domain credential theft and lateral movement with a 99% success rate by using artificial intelligence to control the attacker's perception of the environment. Javelin Networks is the world's first endpoint intrusion containment platform to protect domain networks. Javelin detects targeted attacks and breaches by obfuscating Active Directory, domain controllers, domain identities, domain credentials, and all domain resources. It only takes one compromised machine to jeopardize the entire organization. Don't be a victim. Visit javelin-networks.com and request a demo of AD Protect today. Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. Uh, quick announcement, InfoSec World is March 19th through the 21st of 2018 in Lake Buena Vista, Florida. That's right, we're back at Disney's Contemporary Resort. Mm-hmm. Security Weekly subscribers save 15% off the InfoSec World main conference or World Pass with the code OS18-SW. That's os 18 Dash S W. You can check out talks from Adrian Sanabria, Diana Kelly, and Ed Moyle, Jennifer Manella, Joseph Zacharias, Mark Arnold, Matthias Madu, and Summer Fowler. Excellent. Excited about that conference. We'll be there doing some kind of trivia thing and having fun and basking in the, the sun, which for us is really the lights inside of the, the conference center. Um, so make sure you check out. Uh, our Domain Tools webcast, hosted by myself and Michael Santarcangelo, uh, and Taylor Wilkes Pierce. Sorry, it's the first time we're, we're seeing that. Uh, we're excited That's to have... That's a badass the, name. It is a badass name. I the like webcast name. is called Pivoting Through Malicious Infrastructure, and you will learn uh, how to get an overview of take indicators from your network, including domains and IP addresses, and connect them with nearly every domain on the internet Walk through a deep dive investigation into one of 2017's most notorious phishing attacks and learn how to use domain data and pivoting to profile threat actors and prevent future attacks, which is pretty awesome. We talk about threat intelligence and how you poo-poo it. This is actually a great use case for threat intelligence uh, from a very reliable source. And using that, again, they mentioned correlating that with stuff happening in your network, which was the key point there. So you're definitely going to want to tune into this. It's going to be a fun ride. Intel uh, apparently has a CPU. I'm 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 sketchy, I'm sketchy on these details, John. I don't know. If this is like the breaking CPU thing. Breaking news. Uh, it involves Linux page table isolation. Um, from what I understand, there are patches being applied for Linux page table isolation that possibly relate to an Intel CPU bug. That the really the end result is for large providers like Amazon and Google isolating those processes in virtual environments, or in this case of the vulnerability, not isolating them, which would allow you to access memory in another uh, VM. Largely, we've never seen a widespread attack access this. However, people are all up in arms about this vulnerability. We don't, but we don't quite know exactly what the hell's going on. Um, I mean, there are some people that basically believe that what's going on is they're trying to protect address space layout randomization. So whenever you run a process, that memory address location for that process is going to shift on my computer and on your computer. So if there's an overflow attack, a heap overflow or a buffer overflow, we jump to a memory address location. It can't be the same memory address location on every single computer. It's going to shift. So if there is a way to kind of undermine that and gain access to where memory uh, where different programs reside in memory directly, then that would be bad very bad 
uh, because it undermines address-based layout randomization. So that means you can now write an exploit a lot faster and it'll be a lot more reliable than it was in the past. However, there's a lot of people that are saying, well, if that's just the case to, more, to add more protection for address-based layout randomization, that doesn't seem like it's enough to actually warrant in some situations 50% slowdown in processes, which make a lot of different syscalls. Um, to the core operating systems. That is bad. I have never really seen anything running at 50% slowdowns, but I've heard lots of uh, people talk about up to 30% slowdowns. I only saw one place that was talking about 50% uh, slowdown. And those, and those AMD, slowdowns, those oh, yeah, slowdowns, slowdowns yeah. come when you're implementing uh, ASLR in the kernel or KASLR? No, 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 no. Those slowdowns come in place once the patch is applied. Oh. Um, so we're talking about a performance hit uh, if you actually try to patch it. Now, AMD is supposedly not vulnerable to this. There's a gentleman by the name of Tom Lendaki um, who said it doesn't really apply to us because they don't, um, the micro, micro, what is it? Micro architectures does not allow for memory reference, including special references that access higher privileged data with a lesser privileged mode. So basically it has to do with Bella Padula type security models. If you have a high security zone and a low security yeah. zone, how do those two zones interact with each other? Um, it's not necessarily just Bella Padula, but you get the idea. Um, but some other rumors are saying it has to do with pipelining architecture, which means a queue in the CPU and how you actually queue processes and how you can access it. There's a lot of speculation right now. Um, we don't know what it is. There are some people on Twitter, I'm sure you've seen it, Paul, that say the sky is falling. This is the big one. This mm -hmm. is going to allow VM escape. This is going to shut down address-based layout randomization. Just, I would tell people, just sit back. Let's just chill for a little bit. There's been an embargo. You have the smartest minds at operating systems like Linux and Windows and BSD, and you have the smartest minds at Intel working on it. Just sit back, breathe. Um, but I think this comes back to the patching issue that you're about to talk about, Paul. Yeah, now, this could well, be a very big deal. And well, so also uh, to add credibility, uh, Brad Spengler from GeoSecurity is mentioned in here. Uh, probably one of mm -hmm. the brightest people when it comes to kernel, kernel security uh, and yes. low-level security that we're talking about today. So, um, yeah, and, and well, and it comes down to it, uh, applying these patches that are very low level, such as in the kernel such as in these specialized kernels that are in use by Amazon and Google to run all these virtual environments. Also, I you know, extend it into some of Intel's problems they've had with the management engine and kind of those embedded systems inside of uh, the machines. Like, no one's really talking about patching. It's like when you and I go to conferences, John, and we, we talk with people uh, more so at a SANS conference that are the folks responsible for enterprise security. I mean, if these issues come up, it's more of an academic conversation rather than a, mm -hmm. this is like my daily challenge is to get these things fixed. The daily challenges are with email phishing, vulnerability management, a active directory security, web application security, all of those things. They're not with, oh, how do I patch these low level, either embedded devices in, inside of my systems mm -hmm. or how do I patch these low level vulnerabilities inside of a kernel or as part of a bug in a CPU? Uh, and that was the point well. of this segment was trying to highlight that to say, how much focus do we need to, you know, our pen testers, you know, have this in their, in their arsenal? I, I don't think so. Um, well, I, I think that that's the concern is that it is weaponizable. Um, mm -hmm. And when we're talking about patching on the Intel Q&A for the patches for it, this is where it gets really terrifying. Um, it says the detection tool reports that my system is vulnerable. What do I do? And their answer is Intel has provided system and motherboard manufacturers with the necessary firmware and software updates to resolve the vulnerabilities. Contact your motherboard manufacturer regarding their plans for making an update available. Then the next question is why do I need to contact my system motherboard manufacturer? Why can't Intel provide the necessary update for my system? And their answer is Intel is unable to provide generic update due to management engine firmware customized provided by system and motherboard manufacturers. So what they're saying is there's not going to be a one-shot, one-kill patch right. for this across the board. This isn't even just like trying to patch all the different stray cats of Linux. This is now motherboard manufacturers. That makes it very interesting, especially in the IoT space. Well, and it's very similar to uh, Google's Android, which has been customized by a lot of the major carriers, which mm -hmm. new Android comes out those major carriers have made customizations they have to implement test and roll out the patch and largely to to phones that maybe people they don't want them to upgrade they want them to buy new phones um i think similarly you know what's your your back level support 
for a lot of these motherboards. Or now motherboard manufacturers are going to be faced with the same problem. How far back do they want to go? And I don't know how you know what the well, refresh rate is. Some of these manufacturers is. they don't e- they don't exist anymore oh, either. Yeah, that too. That too. Yeah, there's a lot of churn um, in that. So that that's potentially an issue if some of these management engine things get in this firmware become. I think that's more of an issue than the potentially the CPU bug. Um, I, I think that the firmware inside of your servers, and we, we've seen that before, that when you buy a server, it's not just the operating system you put on it. There's all kinds of other code running on it. And I don't know, it changed names like 18 different times, but, you know, Dell and <laughs> HP all have their whatever it's called that lets you remotely maintain and monitor and manage, manage the it. system. Manage, what is it they call that? I don't even know what it's called anymore. You got like cause... open manage. You got like open manage and all kinds of different things. I mean, Intel even has their own. Um, I can actually pull yeah, it up real they quick. they have their own. Um, with their Intel management engine credential. And that for this particular one, it's remotely exploitable in that situation with valid credentials for accessing it. So almost every single man, every single manufacturer out there of servers, they have some type of remote management solution built yeah. into it. Yeah, Dell used to call it DRAC. Remember that? Yeah. It's like one of my favorite pen tests. We don't tests. see it as much. It's my favorite pen test stories. We don't see it as much yeah. as we used to. Well, uh, so yeah. when, when I was doing pen test, I, I would discover it. And I would find that if you oh, yeah. if you could log in, and I, I forget how I logged in. I think it was a default password or no password or some, some weak credential. Uh, and you log into the management system. And through the management system, you can get a console on the actual operating system through this management, uh, through DRAC, right? That's one of its use cases is, yep. like, if shit's gone to hell in a handbasket, I've got this basically backdoor into my system where I can get access to a console without having to drive potentially, you know, halfway or fly somewhere to a data center uh, and gain physical access. So I logged in, I accessed the console. Someone had already logged in via root on that console session, and magically I was root. That was awesome. Yep, and, and, and that's... And, and that's- you go back to the question of patching that. That is not a Microsoft patch. You're not going to have no. something that stands up and says you need to patch this immediately. If it comes up in a vulnerability scan, if you're actually scanning the inside of your network or if you're even scanning those particular servers or even those IP addresses. So it, it's it's ugly. And this one, I think, is going to be ugly for a while, too. But was, there was you know crypto issues with Intel cores, uh, with the yep. way they handled RSA and the way it was actually being implemented. We got the Minix um, what is it? Ring negative, ring level negative three um, issues that are starting to creep up. And I think what's what you're going to see over the next, let's say, three months. Oh, my God, I'm making a 2018 prediction. Oh, my God. Um, but what I think you're going to see over the next two to three months is I believe that now the eye of Saron is now watching and starting to look at these, you know, the micro kernels. It's looking at the C- chipset and the MMU and it's starting to look at how all of these things work. And I think it's now cracked open. So now you have a lot of security researchers that are starting to look at this. And remember, years ago, with Flash. Once Flash started going down the path where people were attacking uh, Flat AD code and U3D and all these different decompression libraries and finding vulnerabilities in them, then there were a whole bunch more vulnerabilities that were discovered because that is a ripe green field. It's like an Easter egg hunt. And it's basically telling security researchers everywhere, hey, there's a lot of freaking Easter eggs over here. Now they're starting to look at this field. And I think we're going to see a lot more of these vulnerabilities. In fact, we were talking about this three months ago, and now it's kind of coming to fruition as well. I, and I, I think the answer that people will largely have for many of these issues when we talk about basically the firmware built into the system, not necessarily the CPU issue, but if I've got a, a subsystem that needs to be on the network, they'll just say, well, just segment it. And it, like <laughs> I, segmentation is not an excuse for not patching or paying attention to any of the updates or security or maintenance on these systems. While you should segment it, yes, you should also fix those actual vulnerabilities because just because it's on a different part of the network or maybe more difficult to get to that could be a, a trigger for an attacker to go well i i really want access to that right like when you think about gaining unauthorized access to something something that's heavily guarded must mean that maybe potentially there's something worth my effort to get around those protections and if you don't apply any deeper level of protections and maintenance and patching to those systems and it's really just segmented off once an attacker gains access to that, well, then then it's game over. Um, oh. 
And if you don't have, yeah, and if you don't have that alerting, and I think that that's so key, if you're doing segmentation with no alerting whenever segmentation rules are violated, then mm -hmm. segmentation is next to worthless because the bad guys are going to find a way to bypass the segmentation if they are given that opportunity, if you're not monitoring that segmentation. Like if you put in firewall rules in your environment, let's say separate VLANs for sensitive network segments, if you don't have any alerting when someone tries to jump that VLAN and access it from an unauthorized host, then that segmentation does nothing because then I just bounce around the environment till I find a host that can access and then you move over to that network segment fairly easily in a lot of situations. What I think plays into this too, John, and, and, and uh, based on my experience, I don't know if your experiences are similar, is that when you're a systems administrator, like there's a lot of really cool stuff you can use to patch and update and maintain your operating system and applications, right? Like I, I've been experimenting, um, getting back to it with Ansible. And all these really cool things. Inactive Directory is just like so awesome. We have all these awesome people come on the show. A lot of them are SANS instructors showing us all these really cool things we can do to help protect Active Directory and get patches and do this monitoring. And then you go to something like a management subsystem inside of your servers and updating that firmware. And it's kind of like, oh, that's like, that's boring. It's tedious. And it's not really exciting. And I'd much rather go mm -hmm. spend my time writing Ansible scripts and playing around with group policy objects and, and PowerShell and doing Active Directory because that's way more exciting than going, yeah, I got to go update the firmware. And a lot of this firmware, you, you may require physical access uh, to these systems, which means I got to go down to the data center in the cold, you know, frigid data center that's really, really loud and, and apply updates to all these systems. It, I really do think that plays into it. Yep. It's not sexy. God. I just had to think. That's why, you know, we're wearing hats in yeah. honor of those days and how cold they actually were. So cold and so loud. It was like torture being in the data center. Yeah. It really was. Anyway, um, so hopefully we can make that more exciting. I, I don't know. Maybe we need to have like data center hats, security weekly data center hats <laughs> to encourage people to go visit their data centers. <laughs> That'd Probably be better than the than the hand the hand towels we were handing out for a while. We, get, we can only hand those out at certain conferences, but the hats, the data center hats, we can we can hand those out everywhere. Absolutely. Well, uh, John, thank you very much for participating in this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. Thank you everyone for listening and watching. That'll conclude the show for today. Thank you everyone for listening and watching.